Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Harrison Public Library, and I am going to introduce tonight's host from Book Yaya, Delaunay Michelle. Back to you. Thank you. Hi there, I am Delaunay from Book Yaya. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here tonight doing an event for and with Harrison Public Library for their Food Lit Book Club series. Uh, two favorite things in life, food and reading coming together. And uh, we are extremely lucky tonight because we have the incredible Alexander Smalls with his book, Meals, Music and Muses, Recipes from My African-American Kitchen with Mishama Bailey and John O. Morisano with their memoir, dual memoir with recipes, black, white, and the gray about their story of having a restaurant together. So uh, a little quick housekeeping. I know that you're gonna have wonderful questions to ask these three incredible people. And there are a few ways that you can do that. You can pop down at the bottom of your screen, press reactions and raise your hand that way. And a funny little hand will appear in your screen and I will find it. You could go up to participants and, and highlight your name and a funny little blue box will show up. And if you click on the more, you will see raise hand and I will find your hand. Or you can go down to the chat feature and you can put a chat to everybody or to me, Delane, and I will read your question to Alexander, Mishama, and Jono. Or you can read it yourself and I'll call on you. So lots of ways, be involved. This is a rare opportunity to have these three incredible people together and I know you don't wanna miss it. We are going to start with Alexander Smalls, who's going to be reading from this book. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Alexander quickly and I'm gonna make sure that my camera is seen as will probably do great. Alexander Smalls is a James Beard award-winning chef, author and raconteur who was the visionary co-owner of many renowned restaurants, including the Cecil and Minton's. Critically acclaimed and located in the heart of historic Harlem, Minton's, the birthplace of bebop in the 1930s, harkened back to the jazz age, evoking a sexy supper club with live music serving low country cuisine inspired by Small's childhood. His award-winning restaurant, The Cecil, New York City's first Afro-Asian American restaurant, was named Best New Restaurant in America by Esquire in 2014. A 2019 recipient of a James Beard Award for his cookbook, Between Harlem and Heaven, Alexander was recently bestowed the Creative Spirit Award from the Black Alumni of Pratt by Ms. Cecily Tyson. Over the past three decades, the chef and restaurateur has traveled the world studying the cooking techniques and food ways of the African diaspora. As the former chef owner of renowned restaurants, including Cafe Beulah, Sweet Ophelia's and Shoebox Cafe, Smalls has received great acclaim in the restaurant scene, including cooking at the James Beard House, being named one of Zagat's New York City restaurant power players you need to know, and being honored with a legacy award in 2014 by the Amsterdam News, one of the oldest African-American newspapers in the country. Smalls has appeared on a wide range of food and culinary platforms with guest appearances on national TV, magazine, and news programs. He has served as a celebrity chef judge on Top Chef, appeared on The Chew with Carla Hall and on Extra Virgin with Debbie Mazur and was recently featured in the Hallmark series, The Pete's. He has also appeared on the Food Network on such shows as Recipe for Success and Throwdown with Bobby Flay and on NBC's The Today Show. In addition to his success in the culinary world, Small's memoir and cookbook, Grace the Table, which is fabulous, you need to get, is also, um, Sorry, recipes is from, includes recipes from his upbringing of Southern Revival cuisine. Smalls is also a world-renowned opera singer and the winner of both a Grammy Award and a Tony Award for the cast recording of Porgy and Bess by George Gershwin with the Houston Grand Opera. Will y'all please help me welcome Alexander Smalls, who will read from his fabulous book, Meals, Music, and Muses, Recipes from My African-American Kitchen. I think you took up my reading time. <laughs> but it was all fabulous. And I and you have even more stuff you're doing. So I know, I know. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, I, I just decided 
I was going to read uh, uh, from the acknowledgments, which is something I love doing. Um, but then two, two or three minutes ago, um, before tuning on, I decided I wanted to read you something from, um, from the, the chapter, the third chapter, Gospel. Okay, so let me get into it. For me, Gospel is synonymous with Mahalia Jackson. I love watching the occasional appearances by Mahalia Jackson on variety TV shows as a child, The Ed Sullivan Show. Mahalia, Mahalia was a diva, a real queen of song and movement, much like the opera divas I admired, like Leontine Price, Marion Anderson, and Maria Collins. We attended a black church as a child, where once the old Jubilee choir finished exhausting the virtues of a raggedy hymn as only they could, the junior choir would elevate the moment with a Bach cantata or a spiritual art song by Brahms, Mozart. It was usually a medley of culture that found harmony in my hometown Southern church. Every garden is a form of prayer. As a young boy, the stabilizer in my daily adventures was my grandfather, the larger than life, lovable, but strong and powerful man whom I call Papa. My most favorite time was spent with Papa in his vegetable garden. This was a sacred place. In the garden he tended, Papa seemed open and free. While we worked the garden together, he would tell me stories of his childhood. Uh, he would talk about the importance of farming, of knowing the land and where your food came from. He taught me the glory of eating what you farmed and harvested. Papa was a spiritual man. He was not much of a churchgoer, but what I understood was that his garden was his church, his sanctuary, where he spoke with God. It was an honor to work the land with him and help in some way harvest the off offerings of his garden, his bounty. Uh, I felt the garden was where he visited the ancestors, his parents, who were farmers and slaves. I also felt like when I left that garden, I had visited with the spirits who nested and rested there, an invisible force that only my grandfather really knew and understood. For me, it was just magical, a world away from this one that I could escape to to with a simple swing of my grandfather's garden hose. So that is from the, the chapter gospels uh, in Mills Music and Muses that uh, celebrates fresh vegetables and uh, was a centerpiece of my life, that garden. So happy to share it with you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Alexander. I love those stories about your grandfather. Um, I will now introduce John O. Morisano and Mishama Bailey. John O. Morisano is the product of a tight knit Italian family born and raised in New York City. He has been working in the world of media startups for most of his career, which gave him the opportunity to travel extensively and develop his love for food and wine. In his free time, he and his wife traveled more always driven by the location of their next meal. Food and wine has always been their primary hobby, <clears throat> excuse me, and the common thread for their personal and professional relationships for the past two de decades, excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> so sorry. After buying a home in Savannah in 2011, John has started investing in the community he has come to love. The Gray, which was named Eater's Restaurant of the Year for 2017-2018, is a result of his passions for building businesses, food, wine, people, and energy coming together under one roof. John o remained active in the Savannah community, giving back to local organizations by hosting lively events in the yard, the Gray's outdoor area the proceeds of which benefiting a different local organization. He is also helping to reshape and expand the mission of the Edna Lewis Foundation, 
a board he joined as treasurer in 2016, which revives, preserves, and celebrates the rich history of African-American cooking in America. John O spends time in Savannah and New York City. He adores his wife, Carol, more than words can express, and he would be lost without his dogs, anchovy and otter. Mashama Bailey is a New York City girl, born in the Bronx and raised in Queens. Her maternal roots hail from Waynesboro, Georgia. And as a result, Mashama attended grammar school in Savannah at Charlie's Ellis and spent many summers at her grandmother's in Waynesboro. Mashama learned to cook at the hands of the women in her family with grandmothers, aunts, and her mom giving her the best kind of education, a real world one. She attended ICE to round out that education and has studied in France and traveled far for food. She spent a dozen years cooking throughout New York City, the last four of which were at Prune on Manhattan's Lower East Side under the tutelage of her friend and mentor, Gabrielle Hamilton. As executive chef of the Gray, Mashama has earned a number of accolades, including James Beard Foundation's Best Chef Southeast Award in 2019. She also serves as vice chairman on the board of the Edna Lewis Foundation, working to preserve and celebrate Edna's legacy that heavily influenced her menu at the Gray. Mashama surrounds herself with family, friends, and food, and is a firm believer in the old adage that you learn something new every day. Will y'all please help me welcome Jono and Mashama, who will read from their book. Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so um, just one caveat. We are in the gray right now, sitting in one of the private dining rooms. So all of the background noise are guests and various goings on at the gray. So we're in the quietest space we could find, um, but please bear with us. Um, do you want to tell them what we're about to read? Um, yeah, we're about to read the first chapter of the book, and it starts off um, at um, during a night of a very tragic event. So it kind of like takes you right to this place of uh, pain. <laughs> and, um, and I think um, that place of pain, we kind of um, blossomed and there was some real growth in our relationship. So we decided to start the book in this way and we're going to start off our reading in this way. So I'm just going to jump into it. I had nowhere else to turn. Moments before, I was content with my friends and colleagues from the gray laughing, and in a split second, it was all taken away. The phone was ringing in the background. I was in that in-between state that allowed the sounds from my surroundings to intertwine with my unconscious. It took a moment or two for me to discern whether I was hearing my real phone or a conjured phone in my sleepy goings-on. Another ring, and then the sound of the vibrating device on a hard surface, and it became clear. It was most certainly my cell phone, which was across the bedroom on the desk. I looked at my watch as I threw the covers off my lanky six foot one body, my pale white skin almost glowing in the dark room. It was 12.20 a.m. on July 5th, 2017. My wife, Carol, and I had spent a relatively quiet 4th of July earlier that day recovering from a staff party we hosted the day before in the garden of our Savannah home for the team who worked at the downtown restaurant that I co-owned, The Gray. As I navigated the tangle of sheets, two large Rhodesian Ridgebacks and Carol, my adrenaline began to push the grogginess from my head. The Gray was closed that Tuesday for the Independence Day holiday. I could think of no reason anyone would be calling me after midnight on a Tuesday unless it was an emergency. Having grown up in a Roman Catholic Italian household in New York City with a fireman as a father, I had become conditioned to the idea that the late night phone call was never good news. I expected the worst. I made it to the desk and lurched into consciousness when I saw the name Mishama Bailey, my business partner and the executive chef of the Gray. My worry spiked. My, Mishama would never call me at this time of night unless something was wrong. Three years into our partnership, I had only called Jono when I had to. This man I didn't know when we started 
would check in on me constantly to see if I was getting my footing or, but he would check on me constantly to see if I was getting my footing, but I rarely reached out in return. The work was hard at the gray and especially the building of a partnership of which I expected, but moving to a city and living in Savannah alone was harder. I felt like a fraud because I was in over my head. I was making too many mistakes at work and I was still uncomfortable talking to my business partner, who in many ways still felt like my boss. But this night was different. Something terrible had just happened. I had a few choices. I knew that Jonna would come if I called. He had been trying to be that type of friend to me for three years. I was never so vulnerable before. I never had to ask him to come and help me. But on this night, I needed to trust that choice. I had to trust him. So I reached out for help. She just forgot her keys and locked herself out of her apartment. Hey, I said, the roughness of my voice indicating that I was not completely successful. I was not completely successful in shaking off the sleep. What's up? Mishama, who is almost always bright and full of energy, was anything but. As she began to speak, her voice was filled with anguish. Jono, she wailed, using the nickname my parents had given me. There has been a terrible accident, she screamed, hyperventilating into the line, and then stuttering and then stuttering between breaths, she said, I don't think Scott is alive. I haven't seen him. <clears throat> wait, wait, what I thought, what are Scott? I asked, hoping that she was not talking about him, adding what happened. I don't know. It all happened so fast. There was a car. It came out of nowhere. It hit Scott. I saw him go up on the hood but it was going so fast and it hit him so hard that I don't know. She took another shallow breath. Then it crashed into a pole and I think he was still on it. It was bad, John. It was really bad. I knew he was dead. My entire body felt the impact. I remained frozen in the middle of Bay Street, hoping he would walk out of the wreckage. I expected to see him, hear him, hug him, but that didn't happen. I stood there in the middle of the intersection with a ringing in my ears that I will never forget. Shaken, I placed one foot in front of the other and walked forward. The moment I reached the curb, I cried out before I collapsed. <laughs> So we're going to re yeah. leave you there. Yeah. So, um, in this really sort of um, tough moment, it was one of the hardest moments of my life, and um, you know I was overwhelmed and trying to find my footing in Savannah, and really attaching myself to someone. We were attaching ourselves to each other, someone really special. He was a GM at the time and he opened the gray with us as one of the lead bartenders and he was promoted to the general manager um, not many months before um, his this tragic accident occurred. And so it was just a blow. It was a blow to everything. It was a blow to the business. It was a blow to the culture that we created. And it was a blow to Savannah, quite frankly. And it was, it was just a really hard time. And we, we still sort of um, have a hard time kind of uh, talking about it and writing about it really helped, but you can see that we still get a little choked up. Understandably. And I, I just want to say what a beautiful gift it was that y'all, that y'all read that section. And while I do want to back up a little bit and have the three of y'all talk about the routes that led you to this place in your life because Alexander and Nishama, y'all, um, I think fabulously do not have the normal road that many chefs today have. Um, and John, John O, the way that you connected with Nishama is, is the letter that you wrote is fabulous. Um, I, this does bring up the unexpected, you know, that's an extreme uh, 
case of the hardships that happen with these kind of ventures that are of love and of such, such, such hard work. Um, mm -hmm. Reminded me of, of uh, anyway, um, yeah, another restaurant friend who died, Nick, Nick Salloway, um, Jeff Salloway, Nick and Tony's, same thing. Um, so, so if the three of y'all could talk about these kind of hardships, how you recover from that, how it made you stronger. And then if you would like to backtrack to, I would think frankly that the road that the three of y'all took to getting here because it was not the normal, um, you know, CIA, Culinary Institute of America, uh, route that a lot of people took actually gave you more tools for handling things like this. So if the three of y'all would like to jump in with that, that would, I think that would be really lovely. Melanie, let me just say, uh, you know, Mashallah Majano totally wasn't prepared for you to read that chapter. <laughs> I mean, it was so emotional when I read it. And, um, you know, I had to just put the book down mm -hmm. and, and go make a glass of, of iced tea. <laughs> and, and, you know, I was something to eat. <laughs> I mean, I needed to feel good. It was just so powerful and, 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 uh, and it touched me, it really did. And then to have you read it tonight, wow. It just, it, and, it, it, um, and I got emotional. Um, so I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, I was thinking about us and I was thinking about the fact that we did the, we did the reverse. Mm. You, you two left New York and went to Savannah, my backyard, and I left South Carolina and came to New mm -hmm. York. You made it happen there. I made it happen here. Uh, I'll bite. I, I got a head start on you. Uh, by maybe 20 years <laughs> in this industry. But your book reminded me so much of my first book. I know I'm supposed to be talking about meals, music, and music, but really, Grace the Table um, is so right where you are. It, 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 essentially, that book was how I became Alexander Smalls mm -hmm. with recipes at the end of each chapter. And that was only supposed to be one recipe at, after each chapter. The book was 90% done. And I lost my editor and HarperCollins made me put all of those recipes at the, I was furious. And so to see your book come out 20 years, 20, 25 years later and be the book that I intended to write that many years ago right. as a memoir, um, it, it's very exciting to me. Um, and I love the fact that we have all of these, these commonalities in our, in our um, evolution, if you will. Well, that, uh, that just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny thing about writing books, right? Um, or a book in our case, um, at least for me, is like you don't know the impact it's going to have on people. And, you know, the way that you can touch people positively and negatively, <laughs> frankly. Right. Um, and so to hear you say that, um, that's, meaningful yeah that's nice well it's so. what i felt i felt yeah. that, that it, it, you know i uh, when i first opened my first restaurant cafe Bula, it was the first um white tablecloth african centric african-american centric restaurant uh in manhattan i mean uh, essentially no one had uh, taken our food and put it on a plate and called it fine cuisine and um, my, my journey has a lot to do with, uh, as a young boy from South Carolina, I was going to be the first major black male opera singer that the world had ever seen. Um, that was my, that was what I wanted more than anything. Um, at the same time, I was cooking everything in sight and loved cooking and cooking was so much a part of my life, but I was focused on a classical education and, and I got it. And uh, then I, I, I studied abroad, I traveled abroad, I sang in all of the European opera houses, uh, but I couldn't get that gig in my own country at a major opera house. Um, mm -hmm. So it was the third audition at the Metropolitan Opera. 
uh, with uh, James Levine, who this past week passed, uh, renowned uh, conductor. I was studying at the Paris Opera and I was uh, taking classes at La Barenne. Uh, some of you have been around long enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer there, but it used to be. <laughs> you know, I was the last class at La Varenne, <laughs> the very last class. And this is how so, we find out. <laughs> Anne and Scott, so Scott had a stroke the year before. What year and was that, remember, that you were there? It was 2007. Me, and 1984. <laughs> well, Sean, well, I, I wasn't didn't quite a brand in common. This yeah. is too yeah. So, <laughs> and um, you know, so I got there and I was a stodge. So I lived at the chateau, yes. cooked every day for three months. It was glorious, it was beautiful. There was a garden, there was a pool. You were, you just had free reign over everything. And then when they were having classes, you assisted and you, you know, right. taught people the recipes, but it was the place that connected me to Southern cooking that right. reconnected me to Southern cooking because I was French trained. So I was very much in that world of, okay, I'm going to work at, you know, these white, you know, coat kitchens because yeah, I wanted right. to elevate. And then I did that and I loved and hated it. I loved the food and I loved the structure, but I, and I loved the chaos, quite honestly, but yeah. I hated the, um, how male dominated it was and how hard it was. And I didn't like that. And so um, I ended up kind of weaving my way through. I did some personal chefing or whatever, but I ended up at Lava Ren and I was the last class. She, they closed it down. And it was probably because her husband wasn't doing well and he used to do the wine. He right. was the sommelier and she was the cook and yeah. she would bring um, French and English students in. I mean, there's a few people, there's a few people. Um, um, Tanya Holland went to oh, La Varenne. Yeah. Um, um, Jonathan Waxman went there. Oh my there's a God. few kind of awesome people, American chefs that spent some time there. So I'm so happy to be just a part of, you know, I'm so happy to tack my name next to yours and La Marin. <laughs> well, you know, what, what's interesting for me was, it, you know, because I was studying at the Paris Opera House, uh, uh -huh. the schedule, they would allow me uh, to have a flexible schedule. So I would be, you know, at the Opera House uh, doing what I do. And then I would, dash over to La Varenne and do what I was yeah. doing. And, yeah. and, and, and this was how I lived. And mm -hmm. so when my dear friend, the opera diva Kathleen Battle arranged for me to come back to New York and have this audition, the third one at the Met. And now mm. the, after I'd already had a professional career, uh, I'd already had the Grammy and Tony in tow. I, I, I mean, essentially I was known, but the Met was not making room for me. And so I had this audition. Usually you sing one aria and then you begin the, uh, uh, the, another one and then they tell you your fate or whatever. I mm -hmm. sang two full arias, started the third one. I was represented at the time with Cami Artis, the, the premier classical musician uh, agent in, in New York. And what they said to me was, we can see you've grown a lot, uh, Mr. Smalls. We can see that uh, you have, uh, you know, matured and, and, you know, we'd love to work with you. What we have in mind is, you know, some bit parts and chorus uh, in Porgy and Bess. Now, I'd already recorded Porgy and Bess. I'd already done that all over the world. And I'm in Paris, you know, singing Carmen, singing La Boheme, La Traviata, and this is what they had for me. That was the day that I decided I was no longer an opera singer. Wow. The next day after drinking that whole bottle of red wine, I, 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 I put in my suitcase from Paris. <laughs> wow. I set out on my journey. And 18 months later, I was building my restaurant, my first restaurant. But yeah. part of the context in all of that was that having traveled all over the world, had had 
eaten at all the finest restaurants, um, uh, even the ones that have foot servants that stay at uh, behind your chair the entire meal. I understood the 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 difference between um, you know local and mama's cooking versus fine dining. I, I understood how that transformation happened from just food on a plate to food being presented on a plate and the culinary techniques that had to be upheld as you mastered that. You know, let us not forget that the French Huguenots brought the French techniques to Charleston and Low Country cooking um, mm -hmm. a long time ago, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, during the revolution. And so, you know, I set out to create something I'd never seen. But at the same time, I set out to essentially not just have a seat at the table, but own the table. And this is how I started my journey. So when I was reading your book and I was reading how you evolved, you know, in many ways, you know, it was about setting your own table. Setting your own table. Um, and that's how I kind of see the gray. Um, as you know, you and Jono have gotten together and you've said, okay, we're gonna make this about us and the community and we're gonna shepherd and nurture uh, a unique occurrence that also addresses community, race, gender. Um, I mean, that's a lot on that menu. That's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Are you right? It's a lot. The food is saying a lot. That little grain of rice is holding on to a lot of history and have a lot of weight. And I think that we just, we, you know, I think we both had a chip on our shoulders. I think we both wanted to do well. I think we both wanted to be a part of something. And I think that that was sort of like the key elements that brought us together. I mean, I don't know if Jonna would associate that I would have, I had a chip on my shoulder, but. Oh, you'd be good. I still to this day, like, uh, you know, I'm sort of like, I'm good enough. <laughs> I could do that, you know? And so I think that that was really the common denominator for us. And then all the other things like, you know, Jono's really great nose for wine. And, you know, really sort of like, you know, relentlessness about service, right? Like the things that I find exhausting, like he kind of picks them up and runs with them. And I'm just like, wow, okay, cool. I'll just stay back here and I'll just finish, you know, I'll just finish clarifying this stock or I'll just finish sort of like, you know, perfecting the things that are in my world, you know? So it just like, it just worked out that way. It really, it worked out in a way where we just kind of like mill together and the parts that I was missing, he had, and the parts that he was missing, I had. So right. it just kind of like, it just works, you know? Do y'all mind if I, jump, if I jump in with a question that someone has, which I feel like uh, works with what you were just saying, Mishama, um, because you're talking about a creative partnership that y'all work together so beautifully. And um, Bess, who's with us tonight, asked a question in the chat. Uh, Alexander, do you find cooking as creative as singing and performing? So, Oh, you. absolutely. I mean, I have two languages um, uh, on the planet, food and music, you know, and, and I fulfill and, uh, each of them as they fulfill me. I mean, essentially, I grew up um, with the understanding, um, first and foremost, you know, I tell people I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm an artist who works in two mediums, food and music, that's it. And, and because uh, it works so well in, in the social sphere, then, um, you know, it helps me be a great host. Um, and someone who uh, enjoys bringing people together through those two lenses, yes. Do you find that um, one fuel, you just, you kind of just said it, but one feeds the other. Do you find that when that cooking well, or when that, when the, when the um, kind of creativity starts to dwindle, do you find yourself singing more? Well, you, you know, find yourself sort of doing the opposite. 
you know, they work hand in hand. I mean, you know, in my life, I've also, I'm at my best when I can do both. Uh, mm -hmm. Without question, hence the playlist that goes with the recipes for milks, music and muses, you know, um, because I love combining those two gifts. Um, but, you know, one was always there to take me when I was blocked, when I was blocked in classical music and opera, and I couldn't see beyond um, 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 uh, my career going beyond the forces that were working to make sure I, that I didn't have those opportunities. Music stepped in and said, okay, we can't get there. I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, cooking stepped in and said, okay, we can't get there through music, but we can still get there through food. Uh, you may, you know, it, it got, came down to, I can't buy an opera house, but I can buy a restaurant. And the one thing that being blocked uh, as a classical musician um, uh, taught me was whatever I did in life, I had to own it. And not just the seat at the table, but the whole damn table, if not the mm -hmm. building. And I this is how I set out. And, and going back, Jono, to chip on shoulder, interestingly enough, I think the other, the other thing that the three of us have in common um, um, is that we all had chips on our shoulders. We all had something to prove. We all had essentially not gotten our props or gotten the space to be everything that we, we, we could be in somebody else's field. And we had to own the ground and own the playing field and make it happen. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, the chip on my shoulder comes from sort of never feeling, frankly, good enough, right? It's like, you, I just feel like, um, I, I've always just felt like, you know, no matter how hard I worked or how hard I tried, that it was not enough. And, you know, that comes from, you know, growing up in, you know, this sort of blue collar world where my father was a fireman and, you know, we never had enough money and there was, you know, always too much to do and too much rage and too much alcohol and too much um, of non-contributing non things. And so, you know, I was, you know, being the first kid in my family who went right from high school to college was unheard of in, you know, in what, in, 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 in my little world. And so that kind of just bred this thing where no matter what I, you know, it was just always a struggle. At first, it was just a struggle to make money. Like, that's all I cared about. To me, that was the seat at the table. If I could make some money and if I could, you know, have more than my dad and my mom, you know, that, that was the American dream to me. And so I think that, you know, and there, for those of you, I, I saw somebody put a question in the chat to Mishama, you know, being from St. Albans, like for people who grew up in places like I did, you know, Staten Island, which is a satellite borough of Manhattan and Mishama, Queens, a satellite borough of Manhattan, there's this built in, you're not good enough because it's not Manhattan, right? And, um, and so like, it was geographical, it was familial. Um, and so when, when Carol and I, my wife and I got to Savannah and I was at this really low point in my career, even though like, you know, I had some of the trappings of success, like I had made some money, um, you know, we had sort of accomplished some of that, but we worked all the time. And I was to say I was burnt out is an understatement because I was at a really, really depressed place in my life. And I was breaking up with my business partner and I didn't know what was next. And I didn't know what I wanted to be next. And so finding the, the, the gray, the bus terminal, which the gray's housed in an old abandoned Greyhound bus terminal, finding that building that was so dilapidated and decrepit and, you know, in need of preservation, um, that I don't, I, I certainly didn't know it at the time, but that was my moment of rebirth was finding this building and trying to breathe new life into it, whatever that meant. And when I decided to build a restaurant, I knew I, 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 I knew I wanted to be good at it. I knew I want, you know, I wanted it to be known. I want, because that's the chip on the shoulder. It's like, I'm not going to build something that nobody's ever heard of. Like you, you refer to it as owning the table. Like, 
you know, I wanted to own the whole city. Like I wanted to like, I wanted to be like, you know, I was just so, I was kind of pissed off a lot of my life. Yeah. And, but I knew that if I was going to do this, that I needed a business partner who knew something about restaurants because I was passionate about food from the moment I ate my grandmother's Sunday gravy until Alexander, like you, my career took me all over the world. I got to eat in really good places, like, you know, hole in the wall, really good places and very grand places. And I became a restaurant rat. I became fascinated with them, but I knew that um, without someone to share this with that wanted to do it the same way I did that I would fail, you know, and that's sort of what ultimately led me and Mishama to meeting each other, the chip on the shoulder for me. Wow. It's a great story. Um, Mishama, do you, will you answer a question that Stephen Uh Oliver has? Yes. Um, And Jono, thank you for, for acknowledging that he had one. Stephen, do you want to ask? Will you unmute? There you go. Sure. Um, thank you for doing this. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful to, to, to see you all. Um, yeah, my, my point of entry was the chef's table. And as I said in the question, I'm from St. Albans, Hollis, Queens area. And so yes. I just... I, <laughs> yes. I, yes. I, I, Hollis, I, yeah. like, so. I loved, loved the story. And um, I spent some time in, in, in Kentucky. Uh, you know, so if you consider Kentucky the South, I... I've had some experience in the South, but my question, I was so taken with how, how you and Jono both talk about Savannah um, in very honest ways, sort of the positives and the negatives. Mm-hmm. And I was on my way. I had, I, I had uh, reservations at the Gray um, last March, just as things were emerging and we had to cancel our trip, but, but I, I will get there. But the question is, you know, would you advise or encourage, you know, in my case, a black man from the north to be open to moving to Savannah? Oh, well, thank you for your question, Stephen, and thank you for your support. Um, you know, I Savannah's a hard place, and you know, when I think about Black folks in Savannah, I see a little bit of um, a glass ceiling, quite honestly. I see a little bit of there is, there's, um, you know, the Black folks here control the government, so to speak. Like there's a lot of Black influence in the government, but not so much in businesses and are, um, you know, the, the building of wealth here. And, you know, there's not a huge, there's not a Black Wall Street, so to speak, in Savannah. And it also being one of the oldest cities, I find that a little bit um, surprising. And I think that, you know, years ago, there was this, um, you know, dilapidation of the, com- of the business community here. And so everyone sort of spread out. And I know that a lot of Black folks find success on the south side and the west side of and the east side of savannah but downtown is really you see a little bit of hardship um but i do think that the encouraging thing about savannah and being black in savannah is that there's room there's a lot of room there's you can come down and afford to live a better life I have neighbors who just moved from Brooklyn and they are, they're in their, they're young, they're in their forties and they brought their mother down, their mother-in-law down. And then they have their friends coming down because they can actually own something here. They can actually invest their money into property and our businesses. So I think that when you speak about career and you speak about growth, for uh, for blacks, for you, for Steve, for a black man, I, I, I encourage it because I think that those um, grips and those holds on the old old world of thinking are starting to dwindle away. And there are, you know, we've been talking a lot about a seat at the table, you know, and I think it's a great theme for Savannah because there are seats at the table in Savannah. Really, there are. So, uh, you know, I think, 
I think, yes, if you're interested, come down. I think you have to be open-minded. I think you have to see through this. There's, there's, you have to see through, like one of the things that I had to do when I came down and looked at the gray, I had to see through the dirt and the grime that was in the building and see the possibilities of it. So, and I think Savannah is a lot like that. You kind of have to see through a little bit of the grime and see that there's opportunities to build and grow here really great sort of middle-aged community emerging here. Thank you. You're welcome. There, there are a couple of other comments that I'll just take a moment to jump in. Jacqueline, did you want to tell them that you had uh, Alexandra? She had the opportunity to eat at the Sea Seal and several times, Ashama and Jono at the Gray and once at the Gray Market. And she'll be back in Savannah in September and we'll be back there. Um, so that's lovely to hear. And in September, Jacqueline. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can we all jump to that? Yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> uh, and a question, Does how does Savannah compare to Charleston? Well, sure Alexander well. may say it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that it, it, if Charleston and New Orleans had a baby, her name is yes. Savannah. Yes, I agree. Yes. <laughs> it's got a lot of the um, physical beauty and um, and Charleston, you know, imagery to it, but it's a little dirty and it's a little, it's it's a little a little slutty. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you help me out with that one. I, see, I have nothing to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, being from an old New Orleans family, I resist the slutty part. But... <laughs> about it. Well, Mishama stole like an old sort of. Um, uh, joke that goes around the South and, you know, there's various versions of it, but like in Atlanta, they ask you what you do for a living in Macon. They ask you what church you belong to in Charleston. They ask you what your mom's maiden name was. And in Savannah, they ask you what you want to drink. So that's the difference. That's I love how they it. compare. A little fast and loose here. Yeah. I love it. I love um, it. Yeah. So, um, I know um, we wanted to talk a little bit about how Mishama and I met and how she ended up in Savannah and just real quickly. Um, so after I kind of had come to this epiphany that I needed a business partner to be successful at opening a restaurant, having never had a job in a restaurant prior to my very first night on the floor at the Gray in, on December 18th, 2014, I knew that someone who could cook, who knew about how kitchens work, you know, all those things. Like I knew a little bit about running businesses just in general and starting businesses. And so on a trip, on a drive from um, Savannah back to New York City, I was listening to a book by um, the woman who owns Prune, um, which is a great, one of America's great restaurants on the Lower East Side of Manhattan on First and First. Um, and her name was, is Gabrielle Hamilton. And I was listening to Gabrielle's book and she was talking about culture in her kitchen and it being female um, oriented and it was gay and straight and diverse and inclusive and familial but professional and all these sort of adjectives that I loved to use when I was considering what the gray would be. And so I just went like, oh my God, this is the woman who owns prune and the food in that place is great. And I just have to figure out a way to meet her. So I went home and told my wife about this drive and how I had a crush on this woman, Gabrielle Hamilton, that neither one of us had ever met before. And she's like, well, why don't you reach out to her? And I was like, no, she's like one of the best chefs in America. Um, and so my wife, Carol, convinced me to write a letter, which I hand delivered down to Prune and basically told her about my harebrained scheme to open this restaurant in Savannah that and I alluded, I, I, I alluded to the fact in the letter because I've reread it a lot now that I wanted to work with someone kind of opposite of me. And, and in very simple terms, to me, that meant a woman and, and a black woman, because being a you know straight white guy from you know New York City, that seemed opposite to me. And after a month or so of me trying to get in touch with Gabrielle, she took a meeting with me. I mean, and which was frankly shocking because like I, it really was a harebrained scheme. 
And in that meeting, I told her my whole plan, I showed her blueprints and you know, went through this whole thing. She brewed us a pot of coffee. Um, and, uh, and at the end of it, she said, you know, you're crazy. And I'm just not sure if you're crazy in a good way or a bad way. So I want to think about this. But I, if I come to the conclusion that, you know, you, you might be on to something here, I'm going to talk to my sous chef, this woman named Shama Bailey, who might be the person you're looking for. And then for the next month, all I could do is like, I literally started saying Shama Bailey in my sleep, right? And, um, <laughs> and one Sunday morning at like 7 a.m., my phone dings. My wife and I were driving like, running shopping errands early on a Sunday morning. And it's from Gabrielle Hamilton. There's an email and it basically virtually intros me to Mishama who I swung over to the side of the world, read the email and emailed Mishama immediately. And we met, I think three days after that email, that Tuesday. Yeah. And so that's how I met beyond this valley here. <laughs> That is such a great story. The final way to shorten that story. No, it's, <laughs> it's the shortest it's version I've ever story. told of it. It's a great story. <laughs> That's so beautiful. What kismet. It was, it was, it was, yeah, seriously. Like I lived, I grew up in Savannah. I went to elementary school here with Charles Ellis. My mom is from um, Waynesboro, Georgia. So and right around the time we met, I was thinking of moving to the South anyway. My, my, I was spending all my holidays in the South. My mom and dad had relocated back to Augusta, Georgia, which isn't too far from where she grew up and not very far from Savannah. And so it was just, it was pulling me. I was coming down here anyway. And when I came back from La Varenne in 2007, in 2008, I looked in Atlanta and I went to Charleston looking for a job, looking to work for a chef. And I, you know, I started, look, I looked at Fig and I looked at McCready's and I looked at um, the watershed and I was sort of like, okay, this is, you know, all right. But I didn't love the cities. I did not, I couldn't, I just wasn't, I just was not vibing with the city. And there was something about Savannah. Savannah wasn't on my radar in 2008, but when I came back to Savannah and I walked around and SCAD being here adds this rich texture to the town and you have artists and you have potters and you have musicians and you have all these kind of wonderful creative people in this space. And they're just like, they're just like protruding out. You know, and that part is what that's the best part of New York City to me. That's the part that I love. So it was very um, it was very it was a soft landing, I think, coming to Savannah because I still get to take part in those things about being in a big city that I love. I get to walk everywhere, or mostly everywhere. It's very walkable downtown. Um, the people are warm, you know, almost to the point where they're a little nosy, but that's okay. That's the South. <laughs> they want to know, <laughs> you know, you have to be introduced to people, you know, you have to be introduced in order to get the business or get the, the right cherries or the best tomatoes. You got to be introduced to people. So that's fine too, because that's how you broaden your network and that's how you meet friends. So it was, it was a, it was a good shift and I was ready for it. I think if I was, you know, 20, 20 or 30, I don't know if I would be so ready for it, but um, I was ready to come down. It was just turning 40 and I was ready to come down here and make my mark. And I was able to see it. I've never been able to live so close to work before. So there's like all these benefits, you know, it was affordable. There's so many benefits to being here. So, um, so it was, it was kismet. I think. It was meant to be. That's yeah. Alexander, how did you pick Harlem to open your spots? Well, <clears throat> I've been trying to get to Harlem all my life, it seems. Uh, I took the long, uh, <laughs> I took the long route, but I remember as a young boy growing up in South Carolina and my father on Sundays would commandeer the side porch, which is the screened in porch where my life, most of my life took place on that screen, screened in porch. Uh, but particularly on Sunday mornings, he would line. My father was quite a dresser. He he dressed. Uh, he's the kind of person who would buy 
you know, eight or 10 suits at a time and four or five pairs of shoes. He was just like that. Uh, and so, and my mother was a dressmaker, so they shared that commonality. And, and my father also was an upholsterer. So creating things was, is, it was really important to his world. But on Sunday morning, he would line up all of his shoes and polish them. Mm -hmm. And he would also bring mine out and kind of, you know, I had no interest because I, I hated getting dirty. And, and <laughs> dirty. So, but, you know, you know, that was time I spent with my father. And he would tell me stories of Harlem and how, you know, my father <laughs> arrived at World War II when it was over. I mean, so he just... It was over, so they just let him stay around there, and he kind of <laughs> tore around and got in trouble. And, and then on his way home, his brother and sister were both chefs in New York City, and they both lived in Harlem. And he stopped off in Harlem. Meanwhile, my parents weren't married yet. My mother was waiting for him to come home to, to start life together, and he got stuck here in Harlem. And it wasn't until my uncle made him go home because no. my uncle said, look, you better not let that girl get away. No, if you right. don't marry her, I will. <laughs> but, he, but he would tell me stories about Harlem. He loved it. it, you know, the city that never sleeps, lights on all the time. So as a young opera singer, it didn't bring me to Harlem. It brought me to Park Avenue. It brought me right. to Lincoln Center. It brought me to all those enclaves. But slowly but surely, after three restaurants, well, an operatic career, and my first three restaurants, and my downtown life in NoHo, SoHo, all around Ho, all of it. <laughs> you know? It's hoeing. Hoeing, hoeing of a storm. So in 1998, it was my opportunity, you know, and I moved to Harlem, a close friend of mine um, was buying a brownstone on Strivers yes. Row yes. and offered me the top floor of this big brownstone. And, uh, and I was like, I've been trying to get to Harlem ever since I got here. And there it was. So um, the other part to that is I got very involved with Harlem uh, community services and all kinds of things. And my new restaurant partner, um, Richard Parsons, who at that time was the CEO of Time There's Warner and chairman, chairman of the board of Citibank. Richard and I, friends for 25 years or more, decided that we wanted to do something in Harlem. Um, uh, though he lived in Tribeca, he was president, no, he was chairman of the board for the Apollo Theater. He uh, really uh, initiated many initiatives and having something in Harlem, we both were committed to. So that's how that happened. That's a great story. But, but you know, I wanted just to touch back on the fact that, you know, uh, in so many ways we mirror each other, but you know, um, you started up here, I started down there and we just like two trains in the night. <laughs> You ended up down there in, 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 in the South and I ended up up here, but doing the same thing, making the same food, uh, cr clearing the road uh, and, 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 and essentially not only being chefs that celebrated the African uh, American kitchen, but also championed and became activists yeah. for its value. And, you know, that's not lost on me because essentially it is, you know, I say to people all the time, uh, at, the, at, the, at the root and the, and the base of everything I do, it is to, um, you know, elevate the recognition of the African-American kitchen that has been so yeah. over. Well, let me tell you, I don't mean to cut you off, but I remember when the Cecil opened and I remember reading that article in the New York Times and how you all, you went to Ghana, I think, and you stayed for months and you researched ingredients and you came back and you opened the Cecil and like, we flocked there. And, you know, in my mind, that was sort of like the beginning of this conversation we're having right now, mm. you know, the beginning of the conversation we're having right now. 
And the, the, the conversation that people have been pulling out last year, two years ago, you were at the beginning of that, you know? And it's like, it's really, and I just spoke to BJ Dennis, you know, yeah. yesterday, yeah. and he's in Charleston and he's, and he's doing a thing in Bluffton and he's trying to make it work. And so, you know, it's really, um, it's really nice because if you can see it, you can be it. Yes. And so I really am thankful for the fact that I saw that restaurant and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can do this. Because before that, it wasn't us telling those stories. Right, you know? right. right. It, maybe in the 70s, you know, um, in the 80s, before my time. But when you're really talking about like important chefs in America, we weren't a part of that conversation. Yeah. And so, and I think the CISO was in the beginning of like really us being able to say, okay, we we want to do fine dining. We want to use the best ingredients. We want to talk about the African diaspora and our cooking, not just French food, not Italian food, not, you know, Spanish food. We want to cook our own food. And that's really important, Alexander, really important. Yeah. It's so important. And we yeah. are the lucky recipients of y'all yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, it has been such a glorious hour getting to listen to the three of y'all. And the one happy part is that we get to have them with us all the time in their great books. So if you don't <laughs> have these, you are missing a lot in your kitchen. And I mean, I read in the tub, read in bed, wherever, <laughs> where you read. So um I happily grabbed Alexander's from my kitchen counter where I keep my cookbooks. It lives there. I made his um, Hop and John cakes today because it's a good day for Hop and John. Um, <laughs> you know it, honey. And uh, Jono and Mashama, what a complete joy to have you here tonight. It is such an honor. This has been a treat. Really, really nice. Uh, thank so you. nice getting to know you a little bit better, Alexander. And thank you so much, Delaney, for inviting us and Oh, Being please. a part of this book, Yaya, yeah, yeah, experience is really great. Thank you. And Giovanna from Harrison Library, without you, this wouldn't happen. So please, um, I'll let you, Thank you. Say good night. And, and I just want to say, Alexander, the first opera I ever saw was that um, opera Garnier. So, <laughs> yet, a, that, yet another, one, yet another Alexander, little connection. Did Alexander sing in that, John? Is that what you're saying? I, you know what? I was such a neophyte. It was 1992. It was Barbara. Did you ever sing in Barbara of Seville in 1992? Um, um, yes, but a very obscure place. <laughs> that, that was my, that was my yeah, first foray uh, to opera. So. That's fabulous. Fabulous. Well, thank you, everybody. This was great. Thank you, I wanted to thank Book Yaga for organizing this wonderful event and to thank our guests, Alexander Smalls, Jana Morisano, and Moshama Bailey for sharing your stories. Uh, I just loved hearing your, your personal accounts and I wish you all the best. And I wanted to mention for anyone who wants to come back, Harrison is hosting another two wonderful programs with Book Yaya in April, on April 22nd, we have, Two authors, Laura, Laura Roydeman, hopefully I'm pronouncing her surname correctly, and Lizzie Pollock. That's April 22nd um, at 7 p.m. And then on April 29th, which is a Thursday at 7 p.m., we have Bill uh, Buford and Melissa Clark coming back uh, in oh, conversation. Cool. So you're welcome to join us as well. That would be awesome <laughs> to have all these wonderful cooks and chefs <laughs> in the same room. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you.